Coonhound breeds are another uh, scent hound uh, breed that we have in the United States. Interestingly enough, all the coonhound breeds we have, and there are six, were all developed in this country. Uh, so, and, and, and most of them were uh, the descendants from the English foxhounds that were brought over uh, from England. The first coonhound uh, championship event was held in the United States in 1948. So it's a, it's a pretty recent uh, sporting event, unique to the United States. Uh, spaniels were one of the first uh, breeds that uh, evolved for upland bird hunting. Uh, so uh, the job of a spaniel is to find it, flush it, and retrieve it. Um, and, and they're very good at it. Uh, there are 10 different spaniel breeds that AKC acknowledges. Uh, the picture on the left is a Courier and Ives uh, painting from 1854. A couple of fellows out duck hunting. I would have thought they would have been duck hunting with retrievers. But in this case, they were duck hunting with spaniels. Uh, the picture in the center shows a more traditional today, a, a, a spaniel flushing an upland bird, which then, of course, is shot with a shotgun. Before the advent of uh, shotguns, though, uh, spaniels were in existence, and they were used by the falconers in England. And here, here it, worked the diff it works different than the Salukis, where the, the falcon was actually left on your arm until you got to a logical place to hunt where you suspected there was birds. Then you let your falcon up and the dogs worked in front of the hunters to find and flush, flush being to get the bird in the air, the game bird. The falcon was already circling above you and it would swoop down and catch the bird out of the air. That's what falconing was, was all about. So spaniels were very popular with the falconers. Uh, hunting with pointing breeds. Uh, now, the ability to point um, gives the hunter time to get over there to where the dog finds the bird. Uh, until the advent of the gun, that didn't do you much good because you had no way to capture the bird other than there were cases where they tried to throw nets over the birds. Uh, and in fact, both of these pictures are European dogs from over 100 years ago. And you will see uh, their tails are straight out. They're not up like we like them in the United States now. Uh, and in general, their body uh, position is a little bit crouchy. You will oftentimes see pictures, paintings that they're more crouchy. And that was due to this net throwing business. Um, they had to get out of the way of the net. Uh, most of the pointing dogs in Europe were owned by the aristocrats, and so they were very specialized. Uh, and they were primarily English pointers and English setters. Uh, but once the feudal system in Europe started to break up and people could have land and had, had a little bit of wealth, uh, they started to develop a wide variety of dogs. The shotgun came along in the mid-1700s. That revolutionized this, this sport. Coupled with the end of feudalism, uh, led to a great increase in the popularity of pointing breeds in Europe. Now the common person had something he could do with his dog and he could legally do it. Uh, but still, he couldn't afford to have a whole stable of dogs. He probably had one and he went bird hunting and rabbit hunting and duck hunting and he did everything with the same dog. So there was a huge development of breeds of dogs in the 50 year period from about 1850 to 1900. Uh, and I think it was due to these social changes that were occurring in Europe. Uh, currently we have 17 breeds of dogs that we test in our hunting and field trials today. The retrievers were kind of the Johnny-come-lately uh, hunting dog, uh, and there are two basic types of retrieves, the marked retrieve and the blind retrieve. Now, the marked retrieve is where the dog sees the bird shot and go down to the ground. The retrieving breeds have gotten so good at marking that bird that if you go to a retriever field trial, you'll be struck by how difficult the tests have become, where they'll, they'll have one bird go down over here, and then they'll turn that dog at quite an angle away, 
and then throw another bird over here. And then they may shoot a third bird in the middle. And then they turn the dog back to that first bird and they say, okay, now remember where that one was and go get it. The marked retrieve, it's a test of several things, but what struck me is it's a test of the dog's memory. Because now you've diverted his mind on these other things and now you turn him back to that first bird and you have to say, run out there and find that bird. Memory, as you think about applying dog skills to more modern day functions uh, can be a very important skill for a dog to have. Uh, the ability to remember. Uh, and that's what they're testing for in marked retrieves. In blind retrieves, that's where the dog, he doesn't have a clue where that bird is. He's going to listen to the handler and the handler's going to line him up and say, now go in a straight line right here and you will run into the scent of that bird and when you smell that scent that's when you should break down and start to hunt to find the bird so it's the, the dog has to go in a perfectly straight line is, is what they want him to do and in order to again these tests have become so difficult uh, that to differentiate between the retrievers which ones are better than others a handler, the, 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 the club, the judges putting on the uh, test will do everything they can imagine to make it difficult on these dogs because they can all do just a regular, you know, 200-yard retrieve. So they'll do things like uh, put, a, put a hedgerow in the middle at an angle. It's, it's, easy, it's more difficult to go through something if it's at an angle rather than go straight pop right through it. So they'll have a hedgerow in the middle and the handler will send his dog, and that dog gets the hedgerow. Well, there's a tendency, like if you and I were walking through that hedgerow, we'd say, it's kind of thick right here. Let's walk over here and find a hole and go through the hedgerow. Well, then if you do that and you go, th then the dog goes, now, let's see, where was I going exactly? You know, I'm, I'm offline now. So you want these dogs to go right online. Cooperation. Again, if you take those traits that have been tested and bred into these dogs and you apply them to, let's say, more modern uh, uses, cooperation is a very valuable trait for a dog to have. And retrievers have it in spades. Um, to show how recently uh, these breeds have come along, the first painting of a Labrador retriever was uh, done in 1823. Again, in England, a lot of these dogs came from England. Uh, and we currently test for eight different breeds in our retriever tests. Terriers are meant to hunt vermin by going to ground, I mean going into their dens. Um, uh, and there are, there are quite a few terrier breeds. Almost, they almost all originated in uh, the British Isles and they were first described in British literature in 1496. So on the left here we see uh, uh, a, a diagram of uh, an Englishman out uh, hunting, I don't know what, uh, fox, badgers, uh, rats uh, in 1560. Uh, today we test those in our earth dog events. The middle shows a typical den that a club has dug and you know put into place to sim simulate a, a, a tunnel. Uh, and we have a couple uh, uh, border terriers approaching that den. Uh, and, and now here you, you, you think of courage. They have to go into this black den just based on their instinct to go in there and it, because they smell something in that den that they're after. There's a, there's a degree of courage to that. Uh, Parson Russell Terrier on the right-hand side is a popular breed uh, for this function. The last group is what I've called public duties. Uh, and there have been a large number of these and uh, a lot of the current uh, function, uh, newest functions come in this area. But one of the oldest uh, is also in this area and that is using dogs in war. And way back when, uh, dogs were actually used as an offensive weapon. When you charged, uh, you had dogs charging with you. And you can imagine the the fear that would put into your opponents. Um, thankfully, that has largely stopped. Um, 
but still, uh, dogs are used in war in, in support functions, and we'll see some pictures uh, of that. Uh, police dogs uh, have been around since about 1900. Now we have search and rescue dogs. Uh, we have detection dogs that seem to be never ending. Uh, explosive drugs, ag products, and many, many more. Uh, and then another one I put in this is uh, therapy dogs. So this shows war dogs, and there, there's a lot of emotion uh, connected with this function. In the middle, it shows uh, the large dogs uh, that were the predecessors to the mastiffs. Uh, this particular breed is now extinct, but it's believed the mastiffs uh, uh, came, evolved from this, this very large breed. Uh, upper left hand side is a dog uh, being used as a carting dog to pull a machine gun around in World War I. Uh, the picture in the middle is a, uh, is a Doberman on a, a statue in Guam. Uh, this statue is called Forever Faithful. Uh, a couple years ago, the, the Doberman Parent Club celebrated their 100th anniversary, uh, and I, I went to that, uh, that event. They had a movie, that, a, a, a movie that was made about this statue, and it, they had retained this is a producer in Hollywood did this. Uh, the just, timing was just perfect for their 100th anniversary, but he, he actually found um, military footage that the U.S. government had in storage and how these dogs were used in the South Pacific. And then he, he went around and he found some of the people in the movie, in this film footage, who were still alive today, the dog handlers. And, he, and, and the movie went back and forth between showing them as a 19-year-old charging onto a beach somewhere with a dog, and now here he was today talking about that day. It was uh, very emotional. I don't think there was a, a dry eye in the house uh, when that was over. Um, in fact, this picture in the lower right was, uh, was, was another one uh, from the South Pacific. Um, it's obviously a, a, a GI in a foxhole. And you think now, if you're on the front lines and, and the battle is going on all the time, how do you sleep? Well, they found that these dogs were invaluable when it came to sleep. And a lot of the soldiers would cluster around whoever had the dog because the dog would stay awake and forewarn you if, if uh, the enemy was coming. Uh, more modern day pictures of Afghanistan and Iraq uh, where dogs are, are commonly used. Explosives and the detection of explosives. Well, man has tried many ways. Uh, you can see in the upper left, uh, kind of tongue in cheek, here's some US soldiers uh, saying, anyone who's driving by with a car bomb, please exit here. I don't know if that works very well. Uh, but on the right hand side uh, are, 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 is, a, is, a, is a retriever, Labrador retriever, uh, looking for uh, trying to smell explosives in Iraq. Uh, smelling explosives in uh, baggage, uh, again in Iraq. And then mine, the removing of mines after the war's over is a huge problem in some parts of the world. And nothing can do it better than a mine detection dog. And here we have a picture of, of a woman uh, trying to find mines in Bosnia. Police and uh, detection dogs, uh, in the middle, we have a dog patrolling outside our capital. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Um, lower, lower left, the dogs are often used in, in this case, it was a, a riot type of situation where they brought in a lot of dogs to control the, the rioters. Uh, Bob's dogs in airports are becoming more common. The Beagle Brigade, you've probably all heard about them. They specialize in finding agriculture products that are not supposed to be brought into the United States, uh, and they smell them in people's luggage. And then obviously uh, uh, dogs used at border crossings to detect illegal things coming into the country. Now detection work, there seems to be no end to our, our ability to find things that dogs can detect. We have bed bug detecting dogs. Uh, one of the most recent ones that I found quite fascinating is uh, a vapor wake, wake dog, where if you're carrying explosives on you, what, anyone, if you're, if you're just traveling through a crowded area, we all have a 
vapor wake following us. Um, and if you have explosives on you, some of that's going to be in your vapor wake. These dogs have been trained to just mingle into the crowd and find explosive uh, vapor wake, and then actually follow the wake till you find the person. Quite fascinating. Uh, cancer detection dogs in the upper right-hand side, obviously a very uh, high use. And as I understand it, mankind cannot yet make a machine that can determine, uh, that can smell the odors that cancer gives off as well as a dog can. Uh, termite detection, arson, accelerant detection, all these are dogs smelling the signature of an owner odor that they've been trained to signal when they, when they find it. Search and rescue dogs, we, we, we certainly know about the St. Bernards and the Newfoundlands. They've been around forever doing their jobs. Uh, and uh, in the last uh, decade or more, we've heard a lot more about search and rescue dogs due to natural disasters or the World Trade Center, uh, where they were just invaluable. Therapy dogs, uh, this gets to our earlier talk, I think, the, the ther therapeutic effect of animal companionship. Uh, that's what Meg talked about, and certainly it's real, and it is a, a, a valuable working function for dogs. So I, I just find this an incredible story that started perhaps 10,500 years ago when humans started to settle down and use dogs uh, in, in conjunction with their work. Uh, dogs have assisted man by herding, guarding, hunting, hauling, companionship, personal assistance, and protecting society from a variety of evils. Today we have a wealth of skills that are bred into our working dogs. In order to maintain these skills, we test them in our performance events. The value of these skills lies not only in our enjoyment of the historical sports, uh, but in their application to these skills to today's needs, but also in their possible application for future needs. Uh, for if there's anything in our future that appears to be certain, it is that man and dog will continue to be enduring allies. Thank you.